everybody. Woo! We're doing this again. Let's hope this is all right. I was getting some worrying information from YouTube that uh, the stream wasn't healthy. It was sick stream, and I uh, don't like that. Um, hi, welcome to uh, yet another astronomy live stream. Uh, it's six o'clock, so hopefully it starts actually getting out to y'all. Um, I had to skip last week uh, and shift it over by a week, but I'll do this again in a couple weeks uh, after this uh, for matters of civic duty, I guess. Uh, but uh, I'm back, uh, and um, hopefully, uh, hopefully everyone's happy and healthy. Uh, I'm uh, doing all right, uh, growing a much bigger beard than I've ever sported in my life, which and I need a haircut. But you know, in the these coronavirus times, these things just get uh, pushed back, like a lot of stuff. But, uh, including this stream, but here we're back on the stream and ready and better than ever. Uh, ready for some looking at space stuff. Um, so let's, um, let's, uh, let's get started today. So in the last uh, time we talked about uh, stars and planets around other stars, which was pretty cool. Um, and we've also talked about our, the planets in our own solar system and we've talked about stars and life cycles of stars. And these are kind of some of the fundamental big things in astronomy is, um, you know, people trying to understand how stars live and die, or people trying to understand how our planets came to be in our own solar system, right? There are ent entire scientists who all they do is, oh, thanks for, yeah, all they do is, um, is look at uh, the, uh, the planets in, uh, in, in, like in a specific planet, like I'm a Martian scientist, I study Mars specifically, or I study one of the moons of Jupiter, pretty cool. And then there are scientists who study other stars, and they study the populations of stars and stars, how they live and die, or they're experts on a very specific type of star, which we haven't talked about all the different types of stars in there. You know, we talked about some of the evolution, but we didn't talk about, you know, some interesting star types. I, I hinted at them, but like, you know, cataclysmic variables or something, or maybe our white dwarf scientists. Like, I know scientists where I went to school, U University of California, Los Angeles, who they study um, the fact that if you look at white dwarfs, which are the remnants of stars, um, like uh, like our sun that uh, like um, like that after they die if you look at, at their atmospheres you can sometimes see um, and this is pretty interesting you can see like trace elements of like heavy elements as if like a planet crashed on a white dwarf which is kind of neat right so uh, what I study though is something a little bit bigger I study galaxies and we're gonna talk today about the Milky Way galaxy and then in a couple weeks we'll talk about other galaxies and we'll just kind of work our way up. But um, I think about and study the, the, the things that I, I think are some of the coolest things in the universe, which are, which are galaxies. Um, and so we're going to start, as I just said, with the most familiar galaxy, which is our Milky Way. And you can see it here. Uh, if we're looking at, at you know, uh, and, and you can see we're looking at a, this is a cluster, a globular cluster of stars. Um, and then right up here. It's orbiting our own Milky Way. Globular cluster has, you know, some hundred thousand stars that are all um, very, very old, generally very red because it's a lot of dead, you know, like stars later in their lives. And the bluer stars, the younger stars, they aren't, uh, they, they aren't, they're not living anymore. So you can see here the Milky Way off in the distance, right? So let's start by actually just going um, home. So I'm going to turn on my information here. Uh, let's go back to the sun. Actually, let's go back to the Earth. And we'll fly, I'll let, I'll let us fly in here. So we're going to fly through another globular cluster, which is going to be a pretty fun treat right now. Um, woof! As we make our way home, right? And what I want to do this is because I want to start by actually looking at um, what the Milky Way looks like from the Earth, right? So we'll get back to the Milky Way in a second. Here's the Earth. We're on the, the night side as of right now. Um, I think this must be Australia right here. Um, and if we, you know, get so we can't see the sun, we can turn or we can just land here. Let's land in the middle of the ocean. So we've landed. And now if we look upward, you can see what it would look like. And I can turn this back off. Um, you can see what it would look like from a very dark place stretching over you is this Milky Way. And so people in the ancient times uh, across the whole world, which is pretty exciting, um, I'm starting to drop a little couple frames, so hopefully that's not causing a huge issue. Uh, I think it's a little hiccup right now, but hopefully it, it doesn't. Right now the internet's been a little bit slow for me, so hopefully, you know, uh-oh. 
we're having a little hiccup, which is no fun. Let me type right now. Um, but, uh, oh gosh, we are really dropping a lot of frames right now. Oh no. I should tell my wife uh, about this. Lara, we are having some real bad internet at the moment. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think mine, oh, there we go. Okay, I think we're back. I think the stream YouTube is back, hopefully. We've got no more drop frames. So anyway, people in the ancient times, when they were looking out uh, at uh, the night sky, they saw these stars and they would look at these stars and be like, wow, these stars, you know, they, they're pretty bright, but, but, you know, they give, they gave them names and they gave patterns to the stars, but they also noticed this band, right? And in this program, it shows the band pretty well. Uh, we can probably change some of the brightness settings so that it's not nearly as easy to see. Um, okay. seems good now. That's good. Just be a little behind. All right. That's good. But you can see this band that stretches over and across. You know, this band right here seemed like something that was not the same as the stars, right? And so ancient cultures gave it different names, right? So the, the Greek name that we go by, Milky Way, which comes from Via Lactea or Milky Way, is because it looked like milk that was spilled. There are stories about, like, Hercules being, like, put to Hera's breast, and when she wakes up, she's pulled he's pulled away and spills milk across the sky, which is, that's a weird story, everyone. That's, like, a strange story to have. Um, but then you could also imagine um, something like like uh, there are Native American stories in, in the Americas about um, the uh, uh, about the like like a, a dog that gets into a chicken coop uh, and, and gets chicken seed and as the dog runs the chicken seed is chased the seed falls off across the sky and so they, they, they call this the way the dog went which I think is a, a, a pretty charming uh, way to describe this as well, the way the dog went, right? But if you are in a very dark area, this is what it looks like. But generally, if you are in an area like near a city or something, it looks like a hazy band, very milky, uh, and, you know, very, like, it, 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 what's, what's interesting is that, you know, like, up until maybe 100 years ago, we actually didn't know what it was. There was a lot of debate. Greeks uh, had theories and if you go to the 1800s, you know, the 1700s, like, like it wasn't until um, Galileo in the 1600s where we actually were able to take a look through a telescope to resolve it into stars. But before that, there were people who said, like, I think that it might be, like, you know, like the ancient Greeks. I think it could be, like, we have these stars where you might be seeing as the actions of quite a few stars really far away. And it wasn't until Galileo used his telescope that you were able to do something like this. Like if I, if I just point at an area here uh, and then I, I turn on my telescope right here and we, we kind of zoom in, we can start zooming in and you see that this isn't just like light. It's actually, as we zoom in, it's, it's you know, star after star after star after star after star, right? So the light that you're seeing is actually just the, an enormous amount of stars. And this is what happened when Galileo looked through his telescope. He resolved some of the stars didn't resolve their, their actual stars, but saw some of the stars that were like, oh, this is this is actually something that is not just some weird gaseous cloud, but in fact, many, many, many stars. Um, after him, a guy named William Herschel, uh, and I really, I really like this. He made this map. He started looking at the stars around us and in the stars of the Milky Way, and he made a map. Here's the, here's his map, um, and so you can see here that. Each star here is an actual star that he mapped where he looked to see the stars around us. The, the sun is the one that's, that's like right over in the center, the, 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 the one that's, you know, pretty, pretty big. Uh, what he did was he said, all right, let's imagine that every star is the same brightness. And then let's look around and say, all right, well, the reason then that it would be fainter is because it's farther away. And we'll map it that way. And what's interesting is that he got this shape and said, okay, it's a flattened thing that's maybe 10 times as wide as it's tall. Um, and... You know, there are some weird prongs. And generally, what he didn't recognize at the time was that there's dust. And so I think that if you if you, if you you look over on the very other side, there's like a weird prong, right? Like, like it goes this way, I guess. Um, that prong is most likely because of dust going towards the center of our galaxy. And so what he's actually, the problem is, is he's not seeing the full breadth of the galaxy. He's seeing some small pocket. And 
in that pocket, he's noticing, though, that in some directions, this way and in this way, he's seeing more stars than this way and this way. And similarly, you could even do that right here. If I turn off the, the Herschel Galaxy map, you could look, you know, and go, well, there's not as many stars this direction or this direction as there is in this direction, right? There's just quite a few stars, and it's because you're looking into the plane of our galaxy, right? And we'll talk about what that actually means in a second. I'm actually going to, I wonder if I could restart this YouTube studio and see if, if it'll come back and show off what, like, let me actually watch what, what I'm streaming right now. Okay, good. It's an excellent condition. Great. So we haven't had any more hiccups. So what's great is that um, after this, there were more studies looking at stars. We started to understand dust. But up until the early 1900s, it wasn't known whether or not this was the entirety of the universe or not, the galaxy, the Milky Way. There were many scientists who thought this was the entirety of the galaxy. Everything you see in the night sky was part of the Milky Way, which was the, the universe. The universe was the Milky Way. And so if you were to go and look, so let's, let's zoom out into space pretty quickly. I'm going to turn on this. I'm just really... So if we, if we zoom out here and I, and I search for the Andromeda, let's look at Andromeda. Scientists at the time looked at this object and they were like, well, okay, this is pretty interesting. So we've got this object. We're getting better and better views. And I've got books in the other room I could probably pull out that shows these, these views, drawings or photographic plates of this, Andromeda, Andromeda, what we now know as the galaxy, but at the time was called the Andromeda Nebula because anything that was fuzzy in the night sky was just called the nebula. And they said, well, this is interesting. Because this looks like something that kind of we would imagine the Milky Way would be. You know, from, from the Earth, you can actually see this with your naked eye. It looks like a kind of like a fuzzy thing. But with a telescope or, and with cameras, you can get a better view of it. And so there was a debate in the early 1900s about whether or not this was inside of our galaxy and therefore inside of the whole of the universe that was our galaxy, the Milky Way, or was it what was called an island universe? Um, which is a theory that Immanuel Kant was one of the first people to really propound, propound, you know, like propose this. And so the question is, what was going on? So there was like a big debate, the thing called the Great Debate between two guys named Harlow Shapley and uh, Heber Curtis. Um, right? Harlow Shapley and, uh, was it Heber Curtis? Yeah, Heber Curtis. And essentially, Harlow Shapley was arguing that, no, Milky Way, that's it. Because like he said, like if this was... Like our Milky Way, if we gave a size for how big we think the Milky Way is at the time, which was, you know, grossly underestimated, and we said that's how big it is, and this is another one of these, this would have to be so far away as to be just, like, insane. Like, why would it be that far away? And he had this guy named Von Manen, who Von Manen had measured, like, taken pictures of a thing called the Pinwheel Galaxy, and, like, noticed he thought the stars were rotating the Pinwheel Galaxy. And he says, if it's that far away, those stars are moving faster than the speed of light impossibly too fast we couldn't if, if we could see them moving and they're, they're that far away then and then heber curtis was arguing no this actually is a, an island unit its own galaxy the milky way is one galaxy among many galaxies right and, and the pinwheel galaxy uh, i think according to him the pinwheel galaxy i don't know how we explain the pinwheel galaxy uh you know like those uh those things um like you know like if if maybe he said well if von Mann were correct then i would be wrong it turns out von Manen was not doing a great job of measuring the rotation. It's very, very difficult to do that, you know, because of it's difficult, it's very far away, and they're moving actually pretty slowly. So if you were to show a picture from the 1920s and now, the Pinwheel Galaxy will look almost identical because there's very little rotation. They'll be observable. So the question is, who was right? Well, it turns out Heber Curtis was the most right of the two. And essentially, what you're seeing with the Milky Way is, in fact, an island universe it's, it's 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 its own it's an entire galaxy and andromeda over here is another galaxy it's the largest galaxy neighbor and we can talk about that a little bit later but what's interesting about this is it from the from the earth you can't really tell much about the size and shape of the galaxy except that it's probably pretty flat right and you have to be very clever about figuring out what the actual size and shape is of of the galaxy 
And so the way that we do that is we start looking at hydrogen gas, and we start looking at star counts, and we start looking at dust and knowing that dust here is not a lack of stars, it's just dust that's blocking our way of viewing stars. And if you look at all those things together, you can start getting an idea of what the Milky Way looks like from within the Milky Way. We don't have a camera like a long selfie stick we can stick out into space here and they can take a picture of the Milky Way, but we instead have to infer based on looking at hydrogen gas, which in many cases, the light from some hydrogen gas isn't bothered by this dust, which is nice. We can look around and tell where it's stronger and how far away it is then. Like to understand as you go around through the galaxy and looking at star counts as well and start looking and seeing what the structure is of the Milky Way. So I'm gonna show a map, kind of a hypothetical map of the Milky Way. This is an artist drawing of what the Milky Way would look like. Ba -ba. So I'm gonna put this over here so that I can point to it because it's a little easier for me if I, if I can point to it. I, I can only point until my green screen ends. But so the Milky Way is a disk. It's a flat disk of stars. In fact, here, we'll, we'll, we'll zoom out. We'll use our ability to zoom out here. We got a really, really motor. Notice I'm moving very, very fast as I get out of the plane. And so you can see here that I'm really floating out and I'm going backwards. So let's get right up above it here. <clears throat> Space Engine does an okay job with the Milky Way, but not super ideal because it's mostly assuming that it's, you know, like a, a shape that, you know, it's, it's fine. It, every shape is equally as, whoops. Um, let's, let's really crank up the brightness there. There we go. And so now we've got two Milky Ways because I've got this other one here. Um, I guess you couldn't see that, but here's the Milky Way and the Milky Way. Notice I actually am on the other side of the Milky Way from this picture, so I can I can do this. Well, let's zoom through the Milky Way and then turn around and look at it from the other side. Here we go, right through the bulge. Woo! And we'll turn around and we'll zoom out. And now we should hypothetically have this looking very similar, right? Whoops. Um, whoop. Yeah, you know, give or take a rotation of it, right? So. There is a top and a bottom of the Milky Way, but it's mostly just dictated by the fact that we tend to like, you know, have a, we tend to be right-handed in everything we do. You know, I was talking with my wife about this, about the fact that, you know why we screw drive righty tighty lefty loosey? It's because most people are right-handed, right? Like right-handed chirality is built in to most people, which is like why we have, you know, like it's because we're just biased towards right-handed people. And similarly, when it comes to things like this, we generally say that like, if you imagine coming out of the of the screen right now it's gonna be hard because my hands but coming out of the screen right now if you were to take your hand and put it up on the screen the the curve of all of the spiral structure means that that's the top that's just how we do it ba -ba. Um, and so that's how I have it right here with uh, space engine as well right the curvature of all of these things right if I was on the other side the curvature would be different it'd be different chirality it'd be like this it'd be left-handed curvature whatever and so if I bring this back over here you can see that there are multiple arms of this spiral galaxy. This is a common thing we see in galaxies. They generally, many of them have these spiral arms. We call them spiral galaxies because that's what they look like. And uh, the sun is located uh, right over, if I, if I, nope, it's hard, right there. You can see where it says sun, a little bit to the right of this. So not in the center. We're not in the center. We're over in what's called the Orion Cygnus Spur, Orion Cygnus arm, one of the many arms. Arms are dictated by the fact that they contain a bunch of stars, obviously. There are stars between the arms, but they're not as dense. And the arms um, like, like are essentially over densities, like you know, jam pack, a traffic jam of stars. We'll talk about that in a second. Towards the center of the galaxy is a uh, different color. You can see in the, the they, they simulate this in Space Engine as well, right? They, the stars aren't just blue in Space Engine here, but they do simulate that the center is yellowish, right? That's a, we'll talk about that. The center is what we call the bulge of the galaxy, and it's it's a different population of stars than they're in the, than the arms. Uh, and we're located about 24,000 light years from the center of the galaxy. Uh, the exact distance is a matter of debate uh, because of how hard it is to measure distances in space. But um, but we've also you can see in each of these drawings that there's like you know brown stuff and red stuff and 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 similarly you can see if I if I zoom in right over here you can see that in fact there's brown stuff and red stuff in the space engine one as well and that brown stuff is just dust it's just space dust space dust is represented like the what we're, what we call space dust is literally just kind of like um, soot like uh, little chains of hydrocarbons, so just soot in space, uh, and it tends to block light at 
short wavelengths, which makes things behind the dust look fairly red. And so there are stars behind it, but mostly the red stars you're seeing are either embedded in dust or there just happen to be older populations of stars like the ones in the very center. The stars in the very center are most likely an older population that potentially formed early on in the galaxy. And then the stars in the disk are, are more new uh, stars that have been forming and forming and changing, you know, like, and, you know, over time. Our, star, our galaxy forms maybe one or two new stars every year. Huh. There are star galaxies that form a hundred new stars every year. There are stars and galaxies that form a thousand new stars every year. Um, the universe in the way distant past, maybe nine billion years ago, every galaxy was forming stars at many galaxies. Most galaxies were forming stars at a much more prestigious rate. We've kind of settled down from that kind of wow west period of the universe to an era of time when the universe is not forming stars as much. But our galaxy makes maybe one or two new ones. And a lot of them, a lot of young stars do still exist, so their stars were formed in the recent past. That's why you see all of the blue light, and it's more obvious in our Milky Way galaxy map here, because this artist has really done this. So. It's the, we have like galactic coordinates here, so you can see all these lines where if you put the sun at the very center, or I guess, you know, sun-based coordinates, you can have these lines. And then there are coordinate systems where they put the center of the galaxy in the center and then split into, you know. I think that the Star Trek quadrants are setting Earth at the very center, which is crazy because the different Federation planets use the Earth as the center. That seems pretty biased. And then they have the galaxy in four quadrants. I think that's how it works. And so the alpha, gamma, delta, gamma quadrant and everything is, is, is that way. But it may be that it's it's on our galaxy. Um, also, I don't think anyone's watching this who cares about Star Trek like this. But I was hearing someone discuss how they're frustrated that, that Star Trek ships meet each other face up all the time. And the answer to that is the galaxy is a disk. It's a flat disk. And it has a top, an up, and a down. So generally, you could just impose some sort of you know rule on ships that... You generally use one side up and down, right? Like it's, yes, space can be any direction. You can come at another direction. But essentially, you could come up and then just when you meet other ships, you, you meet them. In a, they, you, know, you, you see what is the local up and down based on the plane of the galaxy where you are and just orient your ship. Who cares about that? Why did I even bring that up? Anyway, so let's turn off this map. And I'll show you. When I say that the, it's a disk, I mean it's a disk and it's a flat disk. It's very flat. Here's it from the side. Notice what you're seeing here is you're seeing the fuzz from all the stars, but you're also seeing the big freaking ton of dust that's in the galaxy. And the thing is, is that the galaxy has this weird floaty, you know, like, like fat part in the center, and that is the bulge. So we have the disk and the bulge, right? And the disk actually has two components. There's a thin disk of stars and a kind of puffier part of the disk that extends a little bit higher up out of this that's called a thick disk. So thin disk, thi thick disk. But you can see as I rotate around... Whoops, 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 whoops. Hold on, I did. I want to really, really get this right. As I rotate around, it's pretty symmetric, right? But it'd be very hard for you to notice anything else going on in the center if you were inside, like when we are inside the galaxy, you know, and you're trying, like, this is, this is, ooh, look, there's a little dark globule here. That's fun. What are you? Sorry, I get excited when I discover new weird things. Oh, you're a nebula. You're like a weird, oh, you're like a, you're a box. Yeah, you're like a strange dark nebula that's fun sorry i get distracted by things um i don't even know what this is why am i not able to click on it can i click on a star in it there we go um it's an orange giant let me go to that star let's let's actually go to that star because what's inside of a crazy dark nebula right now wow yeah this is a young star in an incredibly dark nebula of gas and dust that's so cool anyway let's get out of there and go back to the milky way we're talking about you know but these big chunks of dust and gas like exists throughout but it'd be really hard to tell what's going on in the very center and if i zoom out again you can see our bulge the bulge is not perfectly round right whoops turn on the auto photo mode that's not what i want to do click the share i want to really crank this up again it's not perfectly round it's not a circle here it's kind of elongated and if i turn on this map again notice that this is an even more elongated version of it. this is, we call this a bar and many spiral galaxies have this bar across the center the actual formation for this is like a crazy dynamical thing, um, but let's let's talk about how stars move in this galaxy. Okay, so stars move in this galaxy in a very specific way. They don't move along a spiral arm towards the center. That's not how it works. Okay, if I turn off the Milky Way map here and zoom out, um, stars are not flowing along this arm into the center. It's not like a a drain where everything's draining in towards the center. What actually is going on? is that stars are moving in circles around, right? 
So stars in this in, on this map here are moving in circles. So they, they, they move in circles. And I think they move counterclockwise if you look down. I, uh, someone will put a comment saying that I'm wrong if they watch this and they are scientists that studies this. But they move in circles around in this direction. And the thing is, is that the spiral arms happen because the stars will, there'll be like these, it's, it's called spiral density waves. It's a complicated thing. But essentially these traffic jams of stars build up that cause stars to slow down as they move into the arm because of gravity. They take a while to get out and then they, you know, reach another speed as they move out and get pulled by the next arm. And so you essentially have traffic jams as, as you move around. And so our sun goes in a great circle around the Milky Way galaxy. And so that, that, that circle actually takes like 200 million years. Like the last time we were here, the dinosaurs were on the planet, which is kind of neat. Um, and it, it moves into and out of arms, right? So we'll be in a different arm in 100,000 years, in a you know, million years, 10 million years, 100 million years. We'll be in a different arm, which is pretty cool. And so that is what's going on. We're not draining into the center of the Milky Way. We're moving and all the planet stars are moving in circles around it, right? And that means, yes, right now you are in fact moving. You might be sitting on your, you know, but the Earth is moving around the sun, so you've got some speed. But also, the sun and the Earth, all of it, the solar system is moving around the galaxy, right? And the galaxy itself is flying through space. So a second ago, you were in an entirely different spot. Oh, now my camera has, had, not, not, there we go. You were in an entirely different spot in the universe. The problem is, is what's the local, what's the standard, what is rest, you know? Einstein would tell you there's no such thing as rest, right? We're, we're all moving, so you could say you are at rest, in which case you're not moving and everyone is moving compared with you or whatever. Or you could say the center of the galaxy is at rest, in which case we're moving around, or the sun is at rest. You know, it's relativity, baby. So, if we go back to our, let me turn off the Milky Way map, the bar in the center was set up by stars. If you have those spiral density waves, you end up setting these, there's like torques and stuff that, that cause gas to move in, that, that, like cause the stars to move in a very specific way around the bar. And so you get these stars moving in a circle and then the bar stars are kind of moving in a, in, a, in a different way that's not nearly as circular, causing this bar to form. Some, some spiral galaxies have bars, some spiral galaxies do not have bars. The answer is a complicated question about how we, these form. And our best theories right now have to do, you know, are, come out of simulations where we simulate galaxies forming. Our galaxy formed when many billions of years ago, there was a pocket of gas that collapsed into a cloud of dark matter. We'll talk about the dark matter in a second. And it collapsed down and eventually flattened to make a disk in a similar way that all planetary for structures form because of gravity pulling into that disk. And then in the very center, you have stars forming earlier. The disk over time would rip gas away from galaxies that it gobbled up. And we see this going on ongoing right now. Galaxies are gobbled by our own galaxy and gas will fall onto the disk. And, that, and then also as stars move around and gas moves around <coughs> and falls into these arms it compresses because the arms have higher gravity density and then causes new stars to be formed so you're seeing the arms which are higher more dense regions of stars have more new stars formed because gas is compressing inside of those arms so to trigger new stars being formed all you need is a gas cloud that has enough gas to compress a reason to compress to make new stars and so the spiral arms offer just that opportunity. So you can see here that this spiral arm is just a denser region, which causes the gas that's in it to dense, you know, to become more dense, which causes more stars, and it, you know, it leads to this. But the stars are moving through it as well. So if I look around here once one more time, it's pretty neat, right? So that's the Milky Way, right? There's about 100 billion to 400 billion stars in it, and so you know the bulge here has an incredible density of stars especially as you get closer and closer to the center of the Milky Way. And the arms have all this dust and gas in it. And all the things that I've shown you are things inside of our galaxy. Here's a way of thinking about our galaxy as well. Our galaxy, if you took this whole thing and made it maybe the size of America, so, you know, so like you put New York over here and, and Los Angeles over here, right? Seattle up here, Florida down here. So this is America. Our solar system would be the size of a quarter. A quarter. So imagine you're holding a quarter. That's our solar system. Our galaxy is the size of the entire continental United States, right? And if you have that quarter, the nearest star to that quarter, to our sun, is still about two football fields away, right? So if someone else took and had a quarter, you could see them a couple of football fields away and hold up your quarter and be like, oh, yeah, that's like our solar system. That's out to like Neptune, right? Our sun would be smaller than a speck of dust, right? So the galaxy is enormous. And the thing is, is, with 100 billion stars and 400 billion stars, 
That's a lot of stars. It's quite a bit of stars. But you're wondering, the question is, well, are, are, you know, does that mean that, that the individual area is just dense with stars? Like, if you took this galaxy and crashed it, like, right into another galaxy, just took two galaxies and crashed into each other, would the stars crash into each other? Well, the answer is no. The, the stars are really far apart compared with, as I just said, each star in this Milky Way size, like, you know, took the whole galaxy and shrunk it down to the size of America, each star is still two football fields away, right? And so imagine if you took, like, you know, and stood people in a line where they were separated by two football fields and had them walk at each other, generally they'd all just walk right by each other. I like to think of ships in the night, right? Like, ships don't crash into each other on the ocean because there's so much ocean. And similarly, there's so much space between the stars, right? That's a pretty cool thing. Like, you know, like, it's similar, like, if I took the sun and shrunk it down to the size of a grapefruit, I'm holding the sun as a grapefruit, the nearest star would be in Peru, down in South America, right? Grapefruit in Peru. Very far, very far apart. So the galaxy, by volume, is mostly empty space, right? A lot of stars, but quite a bit of empty space. By mass, the most thing, you know, that's in the galaxy is not, in fact, is not actually, uh, like, like stars. It's something called dark matter. So let's talk about Vera Rubin. Vera Rubin was an astronomer. She died a couple of years ago. Uh, an astronomer who, she, her job was, and her research, was she looked at stars and the way they moved as you go away from the center of our galaxy and in other galaxies as well, right? And she said, okay, if you've got a star in the center and see how fast it's moving around, and a star out here and see how fast it's moving around, a star out here and see how fast it's moving around, you would expect that because most of the, ga the, the stars and mass in the center is in the center, that as you get out away from the galaxy, farther and farther away, and you find ga stars that are way out here, you can still see there's there are stars that are way out here. They're just there. It's very hard to see. The stars are much less dense, but you get stars way out here. Still, you can see them. Here they are, right? Here's stars that are Milky Way stars, but they're way out on the edge of the Milky Way. You can measure the bright ones, how fast they're moving around the Milky Way. And you'd expect, based on the scientist Johannes Kepler, that the ones that are farther away would be slower. Because the gravity is less and less and less, they wouldn't have to move as fast to move around here. So you'd expect that a star way out here would move slower than a star here, than a star here, than a star here. And she started measuring this. And she discovered that, the that what was actually happening was that every star as you moved out was moving about the same speed. There's like some dips, but generally stars, and she saw this in most galaxies, the, the, the stars were moving, no matter how far away she could find them, at the same speed as the ones that were in here. Which is crazy. This star, if it were moving that fast, it should just be, like, flung out of the galaxy. Right? Like, if you, if you like, have a merry-go-round, and you put a kid on a merry-go-round, and you spin the merry-go-round fast enough, the kid will be thrown from the merry-go-round. Right? Because it's moving too fast. They can't stay on that, you know, and gravity is not strong enough out here for a star moving as fast as she predicted. It'd be thrown out. And she said at the time, there's got to be something going on. There's got to be extra matter. And because she was a woman and because, you know, similar to Harlow Shapley saying like, oh, man, if that galaxy were in our own galaxy, it'd be or outside of our own galaxy, it'd be so far away. People said, like, there's, there's no way, right? There was another guy named Fritz Zwicky, another astronomer, and he was looking at the way the galaxies were interacting and said galaxies should be thrown apart because of how fast they're moving. And he made a similar prediction. Prediction being, our galaxy has to be filled with something that we can't see or measure. And it took many years for us to realize that she was 100% right. And luckily, she was able to, be, in her lifetime, this was just determined, which is great. Um, it's not like some scientists who like lived and died and eventually everyone's like, wow, you were right. We just didn't know it at the time, which is a bummer. Um, but Vera Rubin had discovered, along with Fritz Zwicky and other scientists, that there was something in our galaxy that we now call dark matter. And you can imagine dark matter. And if you follow me on Instagram, here I can, I can post this. If you follow me on Instagram, um, which is here, uh, you can watch my recent video where I... Uh, do a bracket including dark matter that Alma, this uh, Instagram account for a telescope, put up recently. Um, but uh, you can, you, dark matter is, is like a thing that I, I explained on there. But dark matter is essentially some substance that does not touch us or interact with us at all. It interacts with matter by gravity. So if you have a dark matter particle and a regular particle, they'll pull on each other by gravity, but they won't pull on each other. They won't like light will not touch the dark matter. Dark matter does not interact with light. Light just passes right by dark matter. It might be a particle. It might be something else. For a while, we thought it might be like 
black holes, a bunch of black holes we can't see. But generally we think, based on observations of black holes, that it's most likely a, some type of particle, maybe a massive particle, maybe a small particle, that just like we doesn't interact with regular matter, doesn't touch regular matter at all, which is wild. Sometime in the next 10, 15 years, hopefully we'll have some discovery where one randomly does interact with regular matter and we go, ah, there it is. It's a Kevinino, which is a particle I just made up. And if it's a Kevinino, the only reason I get to name it that way is because I've discovered it and when I 100% I win a Nobel Prize. The person who discovers what dark matter is wins a Nobel Prize. Easy. Just like discovering alien life, boom. One of the great discoveries. And so dark matter is an important substance and our galaxy is filled with it. The thing is, is that it's not generally like... Like, it's denser near the center, but it's not very dense. There's just a lot of it, and it forms what we call the halo, which is uh, my favorite Beyonce song. But also, a region of dark matter that is enormous with which, you know, all of the gas that's in our galaxy was pulled together and fell to the center because of this halo of dark matter. So you could imagine this halo of dark matter that surrounds all of these things and, and pulls all of it together. And if you were to look at the universe on the largest scales, all of these dots now being galaxies, notice that there's like what looks like bands of galaxies in this you know, simulation here. Those most likely are along big streams of dark matter. The universe is filled with dark matter, and the, the mass essentially is telling you where the densest part of the dark matter is. So you, it's like the underlying, you know, like, gosh, I, I, there's, there's really good examples that it's hard to see. But like, you know how like major American cities are located generally near rivers and water sources and stuff like because that's what humans need like if you look at a map of of of, of that you would see where the um like where rivers are in the country or if you look at a map of the lights on our on the earth uh like you know at night those tell you where the people are located and similarly what you're seeing here you know in the densest part of where people are located i think it's an even better example like if i if i go back to earth I'm happy to have come up with a way better example. You know, these light patterns you're seeing here, those are telling you where are people located and where's the densest part of where people are located. Here in India, you're seeing the densest parts of where people are located in these major cities here with these streams that go between, which are roadways and, 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 and suburbs and stuff that stretch between the cities, right? There are people located in other places, but you know, but the, 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 the lights are not in and of themselves the, telling you about the density, like the, it's the people that are building the lights, right? And similarly, the galaxies are telling you about the densest parts of dark matter, right? So you can think of people as the dark matter on their planet and the lights are the galaxies, right? So let's continue on talking about our galaxy. Because of the galaxy's dark matter, it's actually more massive than just the stars, much, much more massive. And that actually causes other galaxies to be pulled in and, and, and held into it. And so you can see one of the other cool features of our galaxy is that and you probably saw this if I was zooming around, that these little dots here, these fuzzy bits here, are uh, their galaxies and, and clusters of stars located within our own galaxy. So here's the galaxy sculptor right here. And you can see that it looks different than other galaxies because it's kind of like a really, it's an interesting dwarf galaxy, dwarf spheroidal galaxy. But it has, you know, quite a few stars in a big glob, like a globular cluster. And so our, in the halo of our galaxy are a lot of things like this and smaller, like what we said at the very start, which are groups of really ancient sets of stars that were formed and probably like the gas was ripped away or the gas formed in the stars as it went around. And these galaxies, these objects around here, they have gone on paths around our galaxy. If I zoom out even farther here, you could imagine that this thing is on a course to get wrapped around. And we can see by being very careful that some of these things, these, the, you know, like, like sculptor and stuff, they have tails of gas and stars that extend around our galaxy because our galaxy has kind of gobbled them up as they swung around, has like pulled on them and pulled them out. We make, we call these streams. And so there's the thing called the Sagittarius stream, which is a stream of stars that came from our, you know, galaxy gob being gobbled up by our own galaxy, which is pretty cool. Right, I wonder if I can, maybe this, uh, let's, let's go away from this. Let's click on the Milky Way. Let's click on this again. Boom. So here's the Milky Way. Whoop. And all of these little things, these, these, these dots you're seeing and stuff, especially as we zoom in. I guess that's as 
can we go in a little closer? Oops. What does Jerry say? There we go. All right. So now you're seeing here, all of these are nearby galaxies. 30 parsecs, 100 parsecs. Let's do 100,000 parsecs. 100 parsecs. Yeah, we'll do it. All you're seeing here are other galaxies that are nearby our own, right? This is not very helpful. As we load them in, you can see them a little bit better here. But they're galaxies, dwarf galaxies, and the two major dwarf galaxies are these two, which you've, you've probably been noticing and wondering what they are. And this is the large and small Magellanic clouds. They're represented in, in this program as like a flat plane like that, but they're most likely not. They're most likely an irregular kind of crazy, you know, group of stars. I wonder what, what is that? What a strange bright star we've got there. Uh, whoa, well. Two mass, a red supergiant. Yeah, wow, this is a star that is near its death. You can tell they've really simulated that. But these are these dwarf galaxies here are the largest dwarf galaxies around our own galaxy, around the Milky Way. And they're irregular. So if you look at them from the Earth, they kind of look like this. And it's probably just some sort of strange glob of stars. And it's because of the interaction between these and the, the Milky Way. And because there's not enough mass for it to form like a full structured disk like this. We see a lot of irregular galaxies like this, like these dwarf galaxies. In fact, I have done research on looking for black holes at the centers of these. It's a very, very hard thing to do. But there's a large and small Magellan clouds. They're named that way because they're named after the, the explorer Magellan, which is, you know, kind of lame because they were they're, they're, you can see them very well from the Southern Hemisphere. And native... Uh, Native people in Australia, the indigenous Australians, they were able to see them, and indigenous people in, in Africa as well were able to see them and probably had names that they did. But it was the first Western sailors who were like, ah, oh, look, Magellanic clouds, right? And they, they, you know, I've seen them with my naked eye. If you go to the Southern Hemisphere, try to see them. They're really cool. Um, you have to have a really dark night, but you know, definitely they are they are visible from the Southern Hemisphere, and you know, they're pretty they're pretty neat. So what I want to point out now is that, like, notice here. In this spot, there's not a lot of dots here. In a second, they might load in. But like when I get in here, now you're seeing dots, right? These dots are stars in our Milky Way. Every dot you see at night, all the dots that are in this right now are literally between us and the Magellanic Clouds. They're in our own Milky Way. Every star you can see with your naked eye, every star that like generally that, that, that can be resolved, like that we can see as an individual star, outside of stars in individual galaxies, which you can see with telescopes like Hubble or in the future with James Webb, all of those are stars like inside of our galaxy until unless you can actually, you know, take a telescope and take pictures of like Andromeda. We can talk about Andromeda in, in, next week. But generally, like all the stars that I just I just zoomed right by them, right? If I, if I slow down, you can actually see as they as they kind of build up. All the stars are stars in our galaxy, right? As we fly through, all of these stars are in our galaxy. If we fly out, you can see it gets less and less dense. And then I fly back in and it gets more and more dense with stars, right? Which is a, a trip. Like, so when we look at the stars, you know, at any given time, we're not seeing like our galaxy and then very far away stars. We're just seeing the stars in our neighborhood. It's like being back at that quarter where you're like, okay, back at that quarter and there's like some football fields. Like the town that you live in, that's our neighborhood of stars. Where like from where I sit, you know, like today I, I, I was I was downtown in where I live and I could look out and see the, the distant mountains and see buildings and stuff. Those are like the stars in our own neighborhood, right? But it'd be really silly for me to go, ah, those mountains are farther than the edge of our, you know, of America. Because, no, they're inside of it. And generally, right now, all the stars you see right now are just stars in the neighborhood around where I'm currently sitting. Which is a crazy thing. There are a lot of stars. 100 billion stars. Right? So here's another question. And I don't know if I've talked about this. Um, what else is in our galaxy? So we've got stars. And the stars have range from stars like our sun, stars that are really red, stars that are really blue, stars that are really, really red and, and tiny, like, you know, uh, white dwarfs, the remnants of stars. We have neutron stars, the remnants of larger, uh, like larger stars. We have black holes and we have gas and dust, right? I've shown you pockets of gas and dust as I just kind of zoom through these, these dust pockets here. Here's like just some random red star that I'm flying towards. Look at it. Oop, hello. Let's go to it. Wow, this is like a star, blue main sequence star, binary star, and it's got, it's been burping into its, you know, it's got a crazy hourglass right now around it as it burps off into the, you know, 
this is a star that's been simulated, which is why it says RS up here. Um, but it's got uh, these really crazy outflows that, you know, these are the types of outflows that lead to uh, to gas flowing off into space of heavier elements that, like, you know, lead to us waking up, which is pretty cool. What else is in our galaxy? Well, our galaxy also has clusters of stars, like we've talked about the, the Pleiades, which is an open cluster of stars, or globular clusters, like the one we started off with out in the, in the halo generally. Our galaxy also has planets, we've talked about. And what's at the very center? Well, if we look up Sagittarius A star, the center of our galaxy, as of maybe 20, 30 years ago, we started understanding if we look towards the center and, and look in the radio, there's a source that's emitting radio waves, which is why we call it Sagittarius A star, which stand, A star stands for it's the brightest radio source in the constellation of Sagittarius, which from the Earth, the center of our galaxy is in Sagittarius. And if we start going towards the center of our galaxy, I think I centered it. Yeah, whoops. We get into the bulge, and as we get closer and closer, still about a thousand parsecs away, so let's increase the speed a little bit. As we get closer, we see that there's way higher density of stars, and they're not blue stars, they're mostly older stars, because remember, the bulge was formed first. And as we get closer and closer, and I'll slow down as we get into the less than a thousand parsecs away, it gets denser. Notice it's really dense with stars, right? We're getting closer though, 700 light years away, 600 light years away, any direction, by the way, that I'm looking, there's a lot of dust. The center of our galaxy doesn't have a huge amount of dust. There's some dust in there, but the dust is in the plane of the galaxy. And so when we look at the center from the Earth, we have to look through a lot of dust to get to the actual center, you know, to look at it. So we're 500, 400, 300. Let's slow down. And you can see it now. If we zoom in, we can start seeing it, right? And there's like a pocket of really bright stars in the center. There's a bunch of very bright stars. So we're getting closer, 300. 200, oh, 200, 199. And notice you're seeing it's incredibly dense with stars. The center of our galaxy is just super duper duper dense with stars. And the, the stars at the very center actually are very blue. There's a lot of very young stars, which when this was first discovered by a woman named Andrea Ghez back in the 90s, uh, she was very confused by why so many young stars were, were here. But what she did was she looked in the very center and she looked at these stars specifically. And what she said was, what are the stars doing? Are they moving? And so if I turn on time, let's accelerate time by quite a bit. Let's keep accelerating. Because I think that this is anyway. Notice in the very center, all these stars are moving. Pretty weird, right? She is the person who first started looking at the motions of all these stars. Notice they're all, whoops, let's center this and let's do this. Oh, that's not what I wanted to do. Uh, let's center that, go back to She's looking at these things. It's really interesting, right? That they're all flying around like flies, you know, moths around a flame or something like that. What's going on? Let's pause it. Let's go back to now. What's going on? Why are these stars moving around? What, what are they moving around? Well, she found they were actually moving around um, some object. And if she calculated the mass of this object from all the stars' motions, you can calculate a mass using Kepler's uh, work. She discovered that mass would have to be millions of times the mass of an individual star, millions of times more mass than our sun. Something of a million times the mass of the sun would have to be at the very center of this, which is wild, right? And so this object, every once in a while, would kind of burp and give off some x-rays or give off some infrared radiation. We call that a flare. And she was like, this is really interesting. It's, it's something that gives off no regular light, no light like a star, except every once in a while when it gives off burps of light and it gives off some radio waves and it has to be millions of times the mass of our sun. I think this has to be a black hole. And so she discovered, and I will also admit that a guy named Reinhard Genzel and his team in Europe also discovered the same thing and have, have worked on it at the same time, but generally Andre Ghez and Reinhard share the discovery, discovered that most likely there is a black hole at the center of our galaxy. And so if we zoom in and see the space engine simulation of what it would look like. Let's just go. You can see as we get closer and closer, very slow right now, but it'll speed up. 
these stars are moving away. There's these young stars that probably were formed from some disk that created young stars uh, a long time ago. Uh, not that long ago, you know, millions of years ago. But what, you, what you discover was this black hole. So here is space engine simulation of the black hole at the center of our galaxy. So I'm going to turn the brightness down, put on some sunglasses. And what you're seeing here is a, is a very faint disk of material that's falling out of the black hole and these jets, which is probably there, but probably not nearly this prominent because the disk and the jet require a lot of material to dump onto the black hole. And that black hole is not swallowing material uh, as much. But here you go, as we get closer, there's the black hole at the center of our galaxy, right? So let's turn around. Let's really crank down the brightness so you can see the disk. So this is Sagittarius A star. I'm gonna get right on the disk here. And what you're seeing here is actually, and I think this is such a cool thing, that this program simulates this. You're seeing the gravity lensing light up and around this black hole, which causes this disk. You can actually see the backside of the disk. If you were sitting on the other side of the black hole on the disk, I could see you up here. You could wave at me and the light would travel up and over the black hole, just get bent around the black hole and I could see you. So this is not like it's going up and over it on top of it. It's the light from the other side. Like it's the black hole's just got a disk around it. You saw that, right? If I, if I zoom out, and kind of get up here. You can see it's just a disc, right? Just a disc. It's just, it looks really weird because the black hole is actually bending the light around it. So that right there, that flat thing looking up, it's literally light from the other side of the disc just bending around the black hole. Black holes have a lot of gravity. And so this black hole is not something that everything in the galaxy is falling into. The Milky Way is not flowing into this black hole. What's actually going on is that the Milky Way, uh, because of its mass, there was quite a bit of density of stars, and so probably a long time ago when the Milky Way formed, a black hole formed in the center, or many black holes swallowed each other in the center, which caused this black hole to grow, and as material falls onto it from the center, from the stars in the center, and from star formation near the center that fuels it, the black hole has grown. And this is something that I study that I'll talk about in the future, which is when I, when I talk about AGN and active galactic nuclei and quasars, which is like the thing I care about more than anything. But pre we think that every black hole, every galaxy has a black hole that's probably pretty mass, super massive in its very center. Um, some smaller dwarf galaxies, that might not be the case, but every massive galaxy most likely has black, a black hole in the center. So again, it's too far away to even pull on you appreciably. You're pulled by this black hole, but you're probably pulled by your own computer or by, you know, the people around you stronger than the black hole the center of our galaxy. So the center of our galaxy's black hole, we're not falling into it. It's just there, and it's very, very interesting. Uh, and every once in a while, it burps because material falls onto the disk and gets very bright, and so it gives off a little bit of a burp of light, but it only will do that when material falls onto the black hole. And it's surrounded by this group of young stars that Andrea Ghez studied. You know, you can see here that they've lit this up, but it's most likely that the black hole is not lit as bright as this, uh, as this, space engine purports it to be. And these young stars, Andrea describes this as the paradox of youth. How are young stars formed in such a turbulent and crazy environment as the environment from near a black hole? We think there's maybe hundreds of thousands of black holes free floating through our galaxy, maybe a billion, uh, but generally they're so far away they probably don't affect us at all, which is pretty wacky. So that's generally the end. I think that's all I wanted to talk about. Um, to give you an idea, if we, if we zoom back out, look at how fa how long we have to take to get zoom finally out of the center, you know, to get back out of the Milky Way. The nearest galactic neighbor of any appreciable size to ours is Andromeda, which I talked about in a second. And so if we go and look at Andromeda right now. Nope, not Adrigios. Here's Andromeda, and you can see the Milky Way right up here. Andromeda has like a fun little neighbor, a dwarf galaxy neighbor as well, its own little neighbor right there, you can see, which is M110, right? You see 2605 or 205, uh, which is like an elliptical galaxy. So it's a very different type of galaxy. You see this galaxy here is not like the spirals we've seen, not like the Milky Way, right? Like these are two entirely different types. Of, this is a galaxy that as we fly around it, you can see just as like a big fuzzy blob of stars, right? We call that an elliptical galaxy. It's got a lot of older stars, not a lot of younger stars. It's kind of like the bulge in our own galaxy, but without the disk around it. Pretty cool. We'll talk about other galaxies later, but you know, we should just we'll, you know finish up with the Milky Way. But I just like wanted to show that Andromeda is very similar to our galaxy. This is Andromeda. 
You know where the Milky Way is right up there, right? So they're kind of twinsies. And in maybe 10 billion years, 5 billion, 15 billion years, they're going to crash into each other, which, you know, again, stars won't crash into each other. The galaxies will probably mix up and form something that's a lot like uh, this elliptical galaxy that I was just talking about, right? So you can see the two galaxies here, the Milky Way whoop, and Andromeda right there, right? So we'll finish up right here. Is there any questions? Does anyone have any questions? I've just got a couple of people watching right now, but it's, you know, nearing the end of the hour. I appreciate you sticking through the stupid technical difficulties thing. Did I put on my, is it? Is that going to do anything? It is not. Um, but if there's any questions about the Milky Way or astronomy, this is your, your time to ask them. Um, hopefully people aren't trying to ask questions right now and I'm just not answering because I can only see the chat as it is. Um, if not, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to finish um, Milky Way, Triangulum Galaxy. It's not. It's M33. Where's the Milky Way? Oh, it's way over here. Maybe I was looking at Triangulum and not it. Um, but if not, I'll be back in a couple weeks. And my thing in a couple weeks, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to talk a little bit about other galaxies. And we're going to show some other galaxies. And we may use Space Engine. We may actually um, use uh, something, uh, use some images and stuff or some simulations. It might be a little bit more of a lecture because uh, Space Engine does a great job with stars and planets. But when it comes to simulating other galaxies, it, galaxies are so complicated that it's not, it doesn't have a lot of great galaxy uh, complexity. But I wanna, we'll talk about that, and I'll talk about quasars and AGN and stuff. And then in a couple of weeks, we might, I don't know, talk about large-scale structure and the history of the universe, which would be fun. But I figure this out as I go. You know, If you do have a question, oh, here we go, question. What makes some things in space disk-like and other things spherical? So the disks probably come from the way they were formed. Think about a ball of dough. If you spin the ball of dough, it flattens out in a pizza parlor. I'm very Italian, so I can... Yeah, a pizza pie, it would spin it around and makes a big flat disc. And so that's gravity pulling the disc into a, into a disc. It's, it's just as it was forming, the ball of stars and stuff s started spinning and it flattened out. The thing is, over time, if you take a beautiful spiral like that and crash it into another object, the objects will kind of form a big ball. And because they're moving in a different, they're not moving in the same speed with the same angular momentum as they were earlier, that galaxy, the center one, has experienced a lot of crashes and swallowed a bunch. And it's generally a big elliptical galaxy. Pretty interesting. Yeah. That's a good question, Jeremy. Anything else? All right. Well, this was really fun. And if you do have questions, as I always try to put this up here, you should just follow me on Twitter or follow me on Instagram or something like that. You can send me you know, messages on either of those and ask questions about astronomy or, you know, if there's something in the news that you're like, oh, this is weird, what's going on there? I can, I love to talk about that. It'd be nice, maybe in the future we can also open this up and have like a little corner where we talk about astronomy news if, if, if there's any interesting astronomy news. Otherwise, I hope you all have a really great time uh, this week and next week. Uh, and I hope that uh, you're healthy and you have, you know, things are going okay for you and, and, and you know, that, that these times, which are incredibly trying and incredibly tough, you're, you're trying to keep safe. And I really hope that you're using this as an opportunity to care for other people. If you have extra means, you should try to donate and you know, like, like help other people because right now I think people are really trying to be very selfish about like, oh, my rights are really important. And I think what's really important right now is being safe and recognizing that other people who are suffering need our support. And it's more important to care about other people to care about ourselves. And that's, you know, 